a reading now from the book of Romans, chapter 5. St. Paul writes, We are no longer God's enemies, but have peace with God, because we were brought into a right relationship with God through Christ's death. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning, and I really, really wanted to start this sermon off this morning with a joke, and I searched far and wide to try to find one that was appropriate, one that would be lighthearted and set you at ease, but unfortunately, Google failed me. I mean, with all that has been going on in the world, with all of the craziness, I wanted to poke some fun at it. But you know, they just don't make very many jokes about the world going nuts. They make jokes about people going nuts, but not the world going nuts. There's no joke that incorporates a global pandemic, an economic lockdown and collapse, the unjust killing of an unarmed man, protests and riots, political blaming and shaming, vocal calls to defund the police, and then disarming of a couple of my favorite cartoon characters. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how to be very quiet while hunting wabbits without a wifle. I came up with that on my own, y'all. But I mean, it was so much easier to start off with a pastor, a priest, and a rabbi walk into a bar. But the world's gone crazy. And there are vocal voices yelling and screaming at one another all over the place. And I mean, and social media is in a frenzy. I mean, I have friends who on my Facebook feed are shaming and unfriending anyone that doesn't agree with their position. I have others deriding politicians from both sides of the aisle. I have one people on one hand saying that we must acknowledge our racism and change, and then people on the other hand saying we have nothing to be ashamed of. There's a lot of anger, fear, and aggression. And of course, as the Star Wars aficionado that I am, I am reminded of Jedi Master Yoda's quote, anger, fear, Aggression, the dark side are they. Easily they flow, quick to join you in a fight. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny. You go look far and wide for a pastor in a church who's going to be able to do a Yoda voice like that. <laughs> uh, but those words from Jedi Master Yoda are not the mantra these days. Jedi Master Yoda is completely ignored for a much different phrase. If you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Well, judging by the outrage, there are plenty of people paying attention. In fact, the last poll that I saw, 80% of Americans say that our country is out of control. 80%. When's the last time 80% of Americans agreed on anything? So here's the question that I have for us to wrestle with this morning. What is the Christian response? What is the Christian message that we should be taking to the world right now? Should our message be one of righteous anger? Should our message to the world be a prayer for Jesus' return to destroy the evil should our message be one of condemnation? And perhaps there is a place for all of those things. But I would like to stand before you this morning and say that there is one message that we can bring that is probably more important than all of those other ones. And that message is encapsulated in one four-letter word. Hope. 
hope. And you see, some might think us crazy for saying such a thing. Some might like to, for us to join into the anger, join into the chaos, be like everybody else in taking sides and buying into the madness. After all, you should be ashamed for not declaring yourself. No. No, we shouldn't. We should never be ashamed of living in hope. We should never be ashamed of announcing hope. We should never be ashamed to seek a different path when the world has gone crazy. And I will attempt to show you why as we turn to our lesson for today from the book of Romans chapter 5. Now the book of Romans is a really, really interesting book. It's a very scholarly, philosophical work. St. Paul is a brilliant man and the book of Romans is one of the deepest letters he wrote to the church. And oftentimes when you're reading it, it seems like you can't understand or comprehend a single thing that he is saying. And then suddenly there's a word or a phrase that jumps out that you actually can understand. In some ways, it's kind of like listening to the teacher from the Charlie Brown cartoons. You remember that? Remember how the teacher would come across? Some of you, wah, 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 wah. And then, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you understand that. But then it's right back to wah, 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 wah. Oh, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The whole book of Romans kind of goes on like that. And I'll let you know that that's the way it was for me. For the longest time, I didn't understand this book until just several years ago when I decided to preach straight through it and study it deeply. And once I did, oh my goodness, now I get it. Now I know why this is such an important book, because Paul is making a profound argument about the Christian faith. He starts with one point, and then he builds on that point, then he builds on that point, and then he deals with any counterpoints or opposition, and he he does this so that he can lay out what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to kind of go through the beginning of the letter to lead us up to this point. Just kind of hit the highlights. He begins the book of Romans by announcing and showing how each and every person has sinned against God and is a sinner. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. You are not in a right standing with God. And after laying out that argument, Paul then says that there is nothing that we can do to justify ourselves. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with God. The first basic three chapters of Romans is bad news. And then he lays out the good news. Paul lays out the gospel and says that we have been justified by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus Paul tells us that on the cross, Jesus has made atonement for our sins, and we stand justified when we trust in Jesus' work and not our own. And after that, Paul takes some time to go back to the Old Testament and to show how this idea of grace is deeply rooted in the Old Testament story. And finally, after doing that, he says, now these are the implications of of grace. This is what has happened because of God's work in Jesus Christ. And he starts that in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 with these words. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And I know as we hear those sentences and read them, on one level, we understand them. But I don't think we understand them as Paul means them in the context in which he was writing. And you see, the British theologian and scholar N.T. Wright understands. And I can't do a better job than N.T. Wright in telling you, what Paul is saying. So I'm going to quote N.T. Wright for you. It's an extended quote, but bear with it. It's worth listening to. N.T. Wright writes, the first two chapters, verses, the first two verses of chapter five celebrate our access into the very presence of God himself. We have the right to approach 
This is the language of the temple where certain people get to come near to where God is. Grace here is almost a shorthand for the presence and power of God himself. As a result of being justified by faith, we are in a state of grace, a status, a position where we are surrounded by God's love and generosity, invited to breathe it in as our native air. And as we do so, we realize that this is what we were made for, that this is what truly human existence ought to be like, and that it is the beginning of something so big, so massive, so unimaginably beautiful and powerful that we almost burst when we think of it. When we stand in God's own presence, not trembling, but deeply grateful, and we begin to inhale his goodness, his wisdom, his power, and his joy, we sense that we are being invited to go all the way, to become the true reflections of God, the true image bearers that we were made to be. Can you get your head around that? Can you get your head around the knowledge that because of Jesus' actions on the cross, you now have the right to approach God where he is? Can you get your head around the knowledge that you are in the presence and in the power of God, that you breathe this presence and power as if it is the very air that you breathe? That we as puny, created, sinful human beings are now allowed to inhale God's goodness God's wisdom, God's power and his joy. Can you imagine that? We are now able to see the glory of God. We are now able to experience the glory of God. And when we see and experience the glory of God, we boast in that glory. We boast in that power. We boast about what God has done. We are radically changed because we see something so different than the world around us. We see something so beautiful. We see something so marvelous that we cannot help but act and move and be different. And that's exactly where Paul goes next. Paul says that because we have seen the glory of God, because we have been in God's presence, because we have breathed of God's goodness and wisdom and power and joy, that we do something absolutely crazy. We rejoice in the midst of our suffering. And we got to be careful here because English is a tricky language. We don't rejoice that we are suffering. We don't rejoice that the world suffering. No, that's not what Paul is saying. We have the ability to rejoice in the midst of our suffering. We have the ability to rejoice in the midst of the world suffering. As my son would probably say at this point, wait, what? How? Why? Because Paul says we've seen the glory of God. And and then he lays it out right in front of us. He gives us a series of things that happen. And I'm going to go through that rather quickly and include some of the nuances of the Greek. Paul begins by saying that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance in Greek is the sense of single-mindedness, which means we become laser-focused in the midst of our suffering. All the things that we once thought would give us safety and security and joy are cast aside so that we focus on the only one who can get us through such things. And that's Jesus Christ. We single-mindedly focus on Jesus as the storm rages around us, and that gives us the ability to persevere. And that perseverance then produces character. And character here is testedness. It is a sense that I have fulfilled my duty no matter what was thrown my way. I stood fast to my convictions. I held firm to the faith that had been passed down to me. I did not waver or move about. And thus I have integrity. It's what character is. And that integrity, that character then produces hope. Which means I become more assured, more confident, more convicted that God is my strength and my song. God is my firm foundation. God will right every wrong. God will bring up every valley and bring down every hill. God will straighten every curve. God will bring good out of every evil. We have seen his glory and now we face the chaos of the world with a sure and certain hope. Ah. But if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. If you're not taking a side, you're condoning evil. How dare you preach hope? You should be ashamed. You should be ashamed for proclaiming hope in this when you should be preaching condemnation. 
No. No. We will not be ashamed. Because Paul reminds us God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Which means we are not breathing the same air anymore. We are not hearing the same music. We are breathing deeply of God's presence. We are breathing deeply of God's joy. We are breathing deeply of God's wisdom. We know that all of this will one day be transformed. But also don't get me wrong. We're still going to take care of those who have experienced injustice. We will still feed the hungry and take care of the poor. We will still work for peace and justice in the world. But we will never, ever do so with anger. We will never, ever do so with outrage. We will never, ever do so with depression. Because we dance to the tune of hope. Once there was a wedding couple who brought in the finest fiddlers and banjo players to entertain their guests after their ceremony. The music was so captivating that soon everyone, young and old alike, began to dance. The people flung their bodies first one way and then the other. The church was filled with joy. And as it happens, two men drove by the church building in their brand new luxury automobile. Windows rolled up, radio blaring at full blast. They couldn't hear a single thing from outside the car. And so when they saw the people dancing and jumping around, they stopped their heads, their car, and they just sat there and shook their heads at the sight. What a bunch of weirdos, the driver said to his companion. See how they fling themselves about. I tell you, the folks who go to that church, they're crazy. But no, they weren't crazy. Those guys just couldn't hear the music. Do you hear the music? Do you hear the music of God's grace? Do you hear the music of God's power? Do you hear the music of God's love? Do you hear the music of God's wisdom and his joy? If you do, then you dance to the rhythm of hope. And let us all dance to the rhythm of God's grace. Amen.